Soldiers which will live in infamy. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the Great Crusade. Early this morning, the Allies began the assault on the northwestern coast of Hitler's European Forces. Hello, this is episode 6 of Till Victory, a podcast about World War II and peace. And I've been waiting for that one for, well, for years. This is a special one. This time, I won't talk to a war veteran. We'll get back to it, I promise. But I'll have a conversation with Heather from Pen and Sword Books, the publisher of the English version of the book, Till Victory, the Second World War, by those who were there, as it's released at last, at the end of the month. Thank you so much for your support and patience. I'm so excited it's finally out, and I can't wait to have it in my hands. So, this is a very special episode, and I'm very happy to have made it this far. Thank you for tuning in to the podcast from all over the world. I see people are listening to it in the US, in the Netherlands, in my beloved France, of course. Salut à tous. In the UK and all the way to Australia. This is great and I hope you're enjoying those chats with World War II vets and their families. As of today, more than 30,000 people have watched the little trailer I made on YouTube and Facebook in which some friends and professional actors are reading letters from the book. And in case you haven't, here's a bit of audio so you can have an idea of what you'll read until victory. My dearest mother, not knowing what fate may have in store for me, I'm writing a little note of farewell to be sent to you in case of my death. I want particularly to ask of you and the family that you will not grieve when our ways are parted for a time, but rather rejoice with me in being accorded from above the great honor and privilege of spending my life in the great cause of civilization and right. I hate to say it, dear, but that dinner we were planning for three will have to be cut to two. My buddy Whitey got it on the beach. He died from loss of blood. Can't imagine what artillery, snipers, and machine guns firing at you can do to you until you actually face it. It's like a horrible nightmare. As long as I'll live, I'll never forget that hour of crawling over the beach and then seeing your buddies fall all around you. It's quite a sight to see the people of towns and villages a few hours or even days after Jerry has left. They line the roads, all smiles and wave, and throw flowers, just like it was in Italy. I suppose everyone at home is thinking it will soon be over. I'm not banking on it being just yet. It really hurts to destroy all these wonderful letters of yours, but we're not supposed to carry them at all. I usually carry them until I've read them five or six times. I realize that it must be rough on you, honey, in some ways rougher than it is on myself. I can tell you not to worry, but I know you will anyway. I could tell you that I'm not actually in combat, but I think it's better to stick to the truth. All I can say, honey, is to keep faith and pray that everything will turn out the way we want it to. It was a daylight raid on a large city in the heart of Germany, and I don't think one bomb missed the target. Most interesting to me was to see the armies fighting as we passed over them, and the city's all torn to pieces. I see nothing to stop the boys from continuing their advance straight to Berlin, and in a very short time. What a day when they announced the complete occupation of Germany. Now, without further ado, let's talk about Till Victory with Heather Williams at Ben and Sword Books. Hello, Heather. It's Clement. Hello, Clement. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Can you hear me well? I can hear you fine, yes. How are you? I'm very well, very well. It's, um, uh, I'm afraid it's really wet and miserable here at the moment, so it's, it's all a little bit depressing. It's very autumnal, so I hope the weather's slightly better with you. Uh, it's, it's a good thing we're all stuck inside, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, it's good to finally talk to you because we've been, um, you know, sending each other emails for more than a year now, and uh, now we we uh, are finally uh, getting to talk to each other for real. It's great. Yes, it's nice to put a, a voice to the email. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so so this year um, isn't only the release of Till Victory; it's also the thirtieth uh, anniversary of Pen and Sword Books. So, first of all, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I think we were we were hoping to have maybe a little bit bigger celebrations for our 30th anniversary, so they've had to be 
postponed slightly on, um, due to the coronavirus, which is a shame. But um, we still managed to um, uh, to celebrate a little bit, so that's good. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell us about the the publishing house history? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it's so we've been going for thirty years. Um, it actually began after there were some articles published in the local newspaper, the Barnsley Chronicle. I mean, Barnsley's where Pennsylvania Books are based. Okay. Um, and it's the part of the sister company. They um, um, published some articles on sort of local and military history. And th from the interest in that mm -hmm. led to the sort of decision to create a, a publishing house, basically. So um, uh, we purchased the Leo Cooper in print mm -hmm. um, and that led to yeah pen and sword books so originally specialized well I mean we still specialize mainly in military history I'm one of the um, sort of the UK's leading military specialists mm -hmm. but uh, we do lots of different titles now I mean it's not just military history it can be uh, books on transport um, local history social history archaeology Uh, we have a new lifestyle imprint as well that was okay. released um, in about three years ago, I think it is now, called White Owl Books. Okay. So that looks at health, diet, hobbies, wildlife, gardening, anything. So we've um, we've certainly expanded in the 30 years and yeah. hopefully we'll continue to grow even more, I think. Okay. Uh, how many books do you put out every year? Uh, I mean, hundreds of new books every year. Okay. So, wow. And we've actually just started... Um, doing audio books as well which mm -hmm. is a new thing for us so um uh, yeah you can purchase our books audio now so you can listen to them as well which is uh, a new venture for us but very exciting yeah uh, and hopefully that's something that will continue to grow as well so yeah well I i'm honored to be a uh, part of your collection as i've uh, i've got many uh pen and sword books at home and and i love them all especially the ones about arnhem um And, uh, well, it, yeah, it's great to have your logo on my book's cover. I'm very proud of it. <laughs> and, um, oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> and how important is it to um, uh, preserve history, uh, especially today? Um, I, think it, well, I think it's always important to preserve it. I don't think you can necessarily just say, oh, today. But I think particularly certain kinds of history, they become more important as you go along. Um, mm -hmm. There's been a lot of interest, I suppose, at the moment, particularly in Second World War, because that generation is starting, to, you know, it's, it's coming to an end, really. And yeah. every year that passes, every anniversary, there are always fewer veterans or fewer people who lived through conflicts. And I think usually it always happens too late that people suddenly decide that they then want to know more about that particular period. and that it's very important to try and document it and to talk to the people who lived through it. And then every year that gets harder and harder and harder to do. Um, so I think it's important to try and preserve it continuously so that you don't have to do it in a rush at the mm -hmm. end. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it happened a lot with the, um, with the First World War as well. I think that interest in the First World War perhaps only really intensified in the maybe 80s or 90s mm -hmm. when that generation were coming to an end. So people tend to realize too late, I think, that, oh, we need to talk to these people. We need to know and hear what they have to say. Um, and it should be something that's that's continuously done, I think. It would make it a lot easier and more interesting as well, I think, yeah. all, all the time. Do, do you think there's a growing interest in the Second World War? I think so, yeah. Again, for the same reason that mm. people are conscious that the generation who fought um, and who lived through the conflict will not be with us for much longer. Mm. Um, so there is a rush to, to try and preserve it now. So mm. I think there'll always be an interest in the Second World War. I think in particular in the UK as well. I don't know in France whether it's exactly the same, but there is always an interest in the UK, particularly that the time period, whether it's the Second World War, whether it's uh, the music, the fashion, everything. It's it's becoming quite fashionable now as well. Vintage, we're always saying mm -hmm. that people go to um, special weekends and will dress up mm. uh, in 
1940s clothes and do their hair and do their makeup and dance to the music and mm. um so it, it's that sort of interest i think seems to be increasing all the time so but it's as each generation gets further and further away from it you hope it won't die out you hope mm. the interest will still be there yeah. Um, but that's why if we can preserve it now, it will be there for future generations. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's the same thing here in France. Like, I don't know if you've ever been to uh, Normandy uh, for the D-Day celebrations. Uh, have you ever been there? No, no. I, I've, been to, I've been to Normandy several times and I've been to the, um, uh, to the beaches, and yeah. to the museums and everything. But I've never been lucky enough, I guess, oh, yeah. to be there for, during the, um, the commemoration. Okay, because, because but you you go every year, yeah, right? You, you sort of you try and go all the time. Yeah, I do, and and it looks like it's growing bigger and bigger every year. It's crazy. Like I think it's important for uh, especially my generation uh, because of what we're going through these days. You know, with the COVID and everything, it I think it allows you mm -hmm. to to put things into perspective and. And it helps, you know, to remember what happened 75 years ago, even even if the 75th anniversary uh, went almost uh, unnoticed because of the, the the news lately. But I mean, sure, the, the world is a scary place. But uh, but don't you think things are getting better, like outside of climate change, of course? But do, do you do you <laughs> do you think we, we really take peace for granted? Um, I think so. I think there's always um, a danger that you sort of look on things as well with, uh, how would you say, maybe rose tinted glasses. I think a lot of people look back mm -hmm. and they see the victory and they see everything and particularly every, for the E-Day and the celebrations that we had over here. And there's sort of this nostalgia that there is for the Second World War. And I think sometimes people forget the people who lived through it at the time weren't having fun. Mm. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't an enjoyable experience. Yeah. And that if you speak to the veterans or you speak to people who lived in the cities that were being bombed and had rationing, that it wasn't an enjoyable experience for them and it's not something that they want to do. So I think there's a danger now that people look on it as something that's exciting, mm. which I'm sure there's certain parts of it were, mm -hmm. um, but that you have to be careful to remember that it was a very a horrible period yeah, in of course. history for, for everybody involved. You know, it was an awful thing that humanity did to each other. Mm. So I, I think you have, it's important to try and remember that at the same time. Mm. Yeah. I believe you you read a name in uh, Till Victory that surprised you. Um, it's the the same as your grandfather's, who also served in the Royal Navy during the war. Is that right? He did. Yeah, he didn't serve in the in the navy. He was in the merchant navy. Okay. Yeah. He was. Um, uh, yeah. His uh, his apparently his eyesight uh, wasn't good enough for the um, uh, for the Royal Navy. Okay. But yeah, he he ran away to join the merchant navy. He lied about his age. Yeah. actually to um uh, to enlist he was only I mean, he must have been 17 i think um but yeah so he um uh, he was in the my, my grandpa ken yeah was in the merchant maybe and he served in the um he did the battle of the atlantic so he did the north atlantic convoys yeah and everything so he, he had a pretty i think he saw some pretty horrible things mm -hmm. during the war he didn't really he never spoke about it um much really i think if you it, again it's this horrible thing if If I'd have asked him, or my brother, if my brother had asked him, he yeah. might have said more. But we never, we never did. Yeah. And you regret it maybe now. He unfortunately he died sadly two years ago. But now it's always too late, isn't it? You think, oh, I yeah. wish I'd asked him this, or I wonder what he'd have said. But there were times when we asked him. My brother's in the navy now. Okay. He's a naval officer, and I remember when he first started showing an interest in the navy that my grandpa would talk about it if he asked. Him. Mm. But it wasn't something he spoke about just normally. He wouldn't suddenly start a conversation about it. You have to ask him lots of questions mm. in order for him to, to speak. So I think that said a lot as well for that generation. Yeah, that yeah. it was something personal to them. It happened and that was it. And then you move on. And I think mm. that's it's it's just really sad. And he never left uh, letters or anything, a diary or something you could have uh Not through. that I know of, no. Um, 
And as I said, he he didn't really speak much about it. I even asked my mum and said, did he talk to you about mm. it? Um, but no, she said, again, I didn't really um, give her many details. The only thing she remembers is that he told her a story that I think when peace was declared, when the war was over in 1945, they were at sea. Mm-hmm. Um and the only difference that it made was that they could finally sail at night with the lights on. The ship's lights could be on. Oh, yeah. And the the fact that the whole crew thought this was wonderful and amazing that they could finally see where they were going at night. And it's incredible. You just think, oh, it's so natural. Of course, you'd have the lights on at night. But yeah. for years, they couldn't because they'd have been, they ran the risk of being torpedoed for, by the U-boats. So to live with that the whole time... Mm. And then just the simple thing of being able to turn a light on. Yeah, even even on it's, the ground, like incredible. because you you had the exactly. blackout, the blackout in the UK. Yeah. W- when I talked about you know putting things into perspective, like <laughs> we're complaining that we're stuck at home, and but you know it was same thing seventy five years ago, and and you had bombs falling all over the place, and and everything was dark, and it was very depressing as well. And I think a lot of that came. Uh, people were talking about that at the beginning of well earlier on this year at the start of the. Um, the, the coronavirus mm. um, crisis, and that we people were being told, you know, stay in your home, don't leave, mm. you know, do this, and that it's very simple. All you have to do is stay in your house and <laughs> watch TV. Or, mm. You know, you don't have to go and charge a beach or do anything like this and mm. um, fight anywhere or like you're saying, oh, I don't want to do this, but you just have to try and think of this collective idea and as you said it's very simple that just something like putting a light on mm. in the evening especially now you know at this time of year when it starts getting darker and you have to put lights on and you just think oh mm. the idea of not being able to do it because you risked not just your life and your family's life but your neighbor's life and your town and everything could be destroyed it must have been a, a frightening experience yeah Let's talk about the book. Um, wh- why did you choose in the first place to uh, publish Chill Victory? Wh- wh- what makes it different to um, all the World War II books you could have picked this year? Yeah, I think, I mean, as I said, we publish a lot of military titles. So we're always looking, it's that wonderful thing of trying to find something that's a little bit different. Mm-hmm. And what I liked about um, Till Victory was it's, it provides a more personal way of looking at the events of the Second World War, mm-hmm. rather than just a third-person account of a particular battle or particular situation. Um, and so it was that personal idea that when you're reading the book, it lets you almost, it puts you in their shoes so that you can understand what it was like for these young men and women in some cases as well, mm-hmm. for them to experience the training Mm-hmm. to experience what it felt like being away from family and loved ones, what it felt like to be in a battle, what it felt like after the battle. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it it helps you relate to the people. It makes you realize that they, oh, this person was just like me, um, mm. that you might read and you think, oh, well, you know, he was just a student. Oh, well, I'm a student at the moment. And then he did this and he went there and, They're very honest, I think, in a lot of the letters. Very, some of them are very funny. Yeah. Um, some of them are very sad. Um, but yeah, I think it was that personal way of looking at it. And then with that, using the letters with a combination of them and the chronology of the war mm. so that you do follow the events of the war as it goes through. Mm. Um, I think that's what made it different. But it was the idea of it being very personal way of looking at the events so that you are looking at the people not just what was happening around them it's what ha- it's what these people were feeling at the time and by the way there, there are more than 50 different allied soldiers in till victory do you have any um favorite stories from the book some that struck you more than others um yeah i was i always find the ones where they're all very young But it's the younger ones and then a uh, majority of them probably from the US and reading how excited they all were to go, you know, to, to go and fight and to do their bit and everything. And then the ones that always struck me were, were the ones who were sadly killed mm. very soon. Mm. 
after being uh, in Europe. I think it was uh, in the US Air Force. Is it Roland Whitehead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He 15. was killed, you know, uh, just a month after being in Europe. You know, you read his letters of his training, and he's so excited to be in yeah. the Air Force, and this is his dream. It's what he's always wanted. And then, you know, it's less than a month yeah, after yeah. being there, you know, he was killed. So I think it's and never found. It, Exactly, mm. yeah. And you just, what a, a tragic and sad end. Yeah, he's still um, out there. There are some lovely stories. Of, exactly. Mm. And the fact that I, there are other stories, you know, a, on a similar one, the um, another Air Force pilot, actually, I think it's a Canadian one. Um, is it Albert Vardy, the, the yeah. machine gunner? Who drowned. In the Lancaster, and again. Yeah. Exactly. And he, but he writes in his letters beforehand how he's, you know, he's scared of water and he can't swim mm. very well, and that's his worst fear. And then it's it comes true. Mm. Um, and he had almost a, I think you mention it in the book, quite a, a fatalistic attitude mm. Mm. that he he writes to his mother, I think it is, and he's saying how he's been reading the casualty list yeah. of uh, his All friends, friends who yeah. he trained with. And he said, oh, he's uh, he's been killed, he's been killed, he's been killed, and oh, it's my turn soon, and it's fine. And mm. I think he said, oh, I'm, re I'm ready to go, which is a horrible yeah. expression. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, so I think to have that in his head all the time, and then for it to come true, mm. he prophesizes his own, um, his own death. But yeah, they're the ones that kind of, that stuck with me. I also like the one with the two Canadian pilots who had the same pen friend. Yeah, the young girl. Um, Both kids as well. Was, it was very sweet. Yeah, mm. from um, very you know innocent. Sort of, uh, she was from Sheffield, wasn't she? Yeah, so, and you um, recognize yeah. the place. Uh, like, there's a picture of. I did. Uh, one that of them. was. Yeah, again, it's that little thing, isn't it? I mean, I know that's not going to happen <laughs> to everybody that they're not going to see a, you know, but you see a place or you hear somewhere described and you go, oh, I know that. Yes, I can, I can picture that. And then again, <laughs> it makes the person seem it's strange, more real. And you go, yeah. oh, well, he stood there in that spot. I can go and stand there in that spot. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I quite liked the, the the story of the two friends. I thought that was very sweet. Sorry for interrupting the conversation. But I thought I might read you a part of this poor airman's letter Heather is referring to. Just hope you don't mind my French accent. 19-year-old Jim Miller was a volunteer in the Royal Canadian Air Force when he was killed in a raid over Berlin. A few months earlier, he wrote his British band friend from Sheffield, Maisie. Maisie, I don't want to disappoint you, and I don't want you to think that I'm afraid, and I had to tell you this, but I'm not in the Air Force yet. You see, I will not be 18 until May 9th, but I told my mother that no matter what happened, I was leaving to join the Air Force, Army or Navy on the 15th of May. She talked me out of it last time, but this time I mean it. I'll try one unit, and if I don't make it, I'll try another. You don't need to worry about me letting you down. I'll get into the Air Force if it kills me. It won't be long now before I'll be 18 and I can join up without my mother saying that I can't. When I do get in the Air Force, I hope I can get to England in a hurry and get a crack at a few of those murdering Jerry's. And I hope I can get my hands on old Adolf himself. I'll bet he'll never lead the war against freedom-loving people again. On August 23rd, 1943, while taking part in a big raid on Berlin, James Halifax Bomber was shot down by a Luftwaffe night fighter. None of the crew survived the crash. Jim and his comrades still rest today in the Berlin War Cemetery. Was it the first time you worked with a French author or even a foreign one? Um, how difficult was it? Oh, you were you were a delight to work with Clement. Very very nice. Oh, um, thanks. No, we've done <laughs> we've done uh, other French titles as well. I mean, part of my job at Pen and Sword is to look for titles published in foreign languages. So okay. I predominantly work with with French and German publishers, mm -hmm. um, but have also done, uh, I've worked with uh, Spanish publishers, Italian ones, Polish. Um, so I work with the publishers and if they have certain titles that I think, again, would work for an English-speaking audience and that I think pen and sword readers 
would find interesting. Mm-hmm. I then work with the authors and we translate the book into English and produce it in English. So, um, uh, so yeah, although I must admit this is one of the first times that I've worked so so closely with the book, particularly with you translating it as well. So it was really good to have mm-hmm. your translation and then going through and helping with the edit and, and putting everything together. So um, I really enjoyed it. And it helped me become more involved in the book as well. So yeah. that's always that's always fun. Yeah, and you did a fantastic job. Again, I, I told you many times, and I really, really appreciated uh, our collaboration on that. It's, uh, I, I think you oh, really, uh, <laughs> you really uh, preserved the intention. You know, um, wh- what I wanted to say, what I meant. Um, so I, I was, I was scared I think at so. first. And that's that, one of the hardest things. Yeah, yeah, I think that's very hard sometimes when you're translating um, a book because you want to preserve what the original author wanted to say mm. um it can be quite hard sometimes when you translate yeah. to put something in another language and for it to mean the same to have the same meaning i find that sometimes if i put something into french mm. i always think oh I, i hope it means the same you know i know it's correct but am i trying to give the same meaning across so hopefully we've managed to do that with the book which i think i think we have i read the french your French edition and then I read the English edition and I think, okay, yes, it's exactly the same. It's fine. Uh, only reading the French edition must, you know, take so much time. I, I wonder how, how much time you spent on that book. It's crazy. Like, because it's very, <laughs> very big book. It's uh, 374 pages. Um, how many times have you read it? <laughs> oh, I don't know. A lot. Um, the beauty of it is, I think as well, that, It, it was easier that you could divide it up. The way you you sort of structure the book means you can look at certain sections individually. Mm-hmm. Um, you can read the, everything all the way through, which is great, and it tells the story of the war. But then you can go and look at individual soldiers or airmen or anything like that and read their individual stories mm. so um uh, yeah but i i must have read it oh, dozens of times wow. <laughs> in, in, in both languages <laughs> i'm not i'm not even sure my father read it once so <laughs> <laughs> so when uh when and where will uh the book be available it's uh at the end of the month right At the end of October, yeah, which yeah. is due for release at the end of October. Um, mm-hmm. You can obviously, it'll be available from the Pen and Sword website, yeah. um, which is www.pen-and-sword.co.uk. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously, it'll have all the sort of online retailers as well and bookshops. So, um, yeah, it's all very exciting. I can't believe it's actually here. We seem to have been talking about this book mm. for months and months. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, it's it's going to be very exciting, I think, to see it, yeah. to be able to hold a copy. Yeah, especially for me, because I've spent more than 15 years uh, working on this. And uh, yeah, and, and the English version was always my, my first goal. You know, I, I know it appeals to, um, you know, the Americans and the British, and because there are a lot of American, British, Canadian soldiers in it, and, and very few French soldiers. Um, so I always wanted to, uh, and, and also with the families, you know, because I, I've, I've been in touch with almost 50 families, you know, from mm. veterans of the book, and they're, they are so looking forward to uh having the book and i've been making that promise for years now you know that way yeah yeah it's coming yeah. it's coming <laughs> so now it's finally <laughs> getting real and i'm looking forward to uh having a copy uh, as well but w- will it be available um overseas as well like in the us it's available yeah it will be available uh, overseas so i think people will need to check with their local retailers as well um mm-hmm. but it's easily available to order online so um, uh, um even if you get from the pen and sword website it's available you know we can ship all over the world so that's um great. that's not a problem great so thank you very much for your time heather to conclude um is there anything you'd like to say um no i just I think I'm really, like I said before, I'm really excited to to see it, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, I know, it, I mean, it, it looks fabulous when uh, I've seen the proofs and things like that, but it's always different when you can actually hold it in your hands and, and read through it. And I'm excited for you as well. I know how much time and effort you've put into this book. So um, uh, I hope, you, well, I know you're excited, but yeah, um, uh, yeah I, I, I'm sure it's going to be uh, worthwhile. I did want to ask you, actually. Yeah. We were talking about, 
reading, obviously reading it in French and in English, mm -hmm. and you have these letters, and the majority of the letters are from British or American or Canadian soldiers. Mm -hmm. Did you struggle with any aspects of the language when you were reading the letters to, you know, to whether you were then translating them into French or um, or anything? Did they were there anything? Yes, yeah, so, you know, sort of little were they phrases that they used or words that you didn't understand. Well, most of the soldiers actually used very basic language. Um, you know, some of mm -hmm. them didn't go to, to school for very long, and and it was actually yeah. um, most of the time quite easy to read. Um, but the problem was, uh, you know, sometimes they meant things like you you had to read between the lines. So yeah. I had to be very careful uh, with that. But the most difficult thing I, I think was to decipher uh, like the handwriting. Um, uh, yeah. Some of them, and, and especially British officers. I I don't know why it's it's a typical <laughs> British officers thing. Uh, like it's it's like doctors, you know. They 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 write um, in a very uh, particular way, and and there's one yeah. especially uh, um, in the book. It's uh, Desmond Finney. His handwriting is terrible. It, it took me. Uh, uh, more than a week to uh, completely um, decipher one of his letters, uh, the one he writes uh, when he's in Dunkirk um, during the evacuation. Um, yeah. it's, it was so difficult. So sometimes I, I, I needed some help, you know, from um, British or American friends to, to help me decipher certain words. But, uh, but um, no, I actually get used to it after a while, you know, because I had to read yeah. thousands and thousands of letters to, uh, to pick the ones that would, you know, make the, the cut. So, uh, yeah. And what happens to the letters that didn't make the cut? What do you do with those? Uh, they're they're Are not they still... they're not that interesting, you know, uh, because you know because of <laughs> yeah because of censorship, you know, at the time, um, mm. uh, there are only about one person of the letters that are actually interesting, you know, with combat related content or very emotional content. Um, most yeah. of the letters were just personal uh, family matters, so yeah. um, I only focused on the the ones that were very interesting, like s some soldiers uh, actually didn't care about censorship um, because you know the censor they 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 were very busy they were uh, most of the time uh, company commanders um, who had to go through a big stack of letters at the end of a fighting day you know so they yeah. uh, they did their job quickly and and one of the soldiers in the book actually says that he's friends with the censor and that he signs the envelopes uh, even before he actually writes the letters so uh, <laughs> yeah i thought about that yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you can write what you want after that. It's yeah, fun. yeah. And the officers, they uh, censored their uh, own um, letters. So they knew that if the enemy got to their letters, they, they're, they're, that might be a problem, you know, because uh, of the information that, that was in there. But the urge of saying what they went through um, and telling their families in what state of mind they were in, you know, it's mm. it was more important than sticking to the rule. So... So those yeah. are the very interesting letters, always, but they are very rare. I thought find. it was interesting as well that the way they were different, um, depending on who they were writing to. Mm. There were some where they would write to uh, their friends, so they might be in the armed forces as well, or somewhere, another theatre of war, and they would be quite frank with them, yeah. and quite honest, and say, oh, you know what it's like here, and, and things like that. Yeah. And then when you read the letters that they write to their mum or to their wife or girlfriend, mm. it's very different. It's all, oh, it's, I'm fine, everything's okay, please don't worry about me, it's not that bad here, or things. So uh, I found it very interesting the way that they would write differently depending on the person. Who yeah, they were, you know, who was receiving the letter? Because they didn't want to worry uh, their uh, close yeah. friends or families, and and you know this is why all the research was very important because uh, sometimes you have a letter that is not that interesting, you know, with, with yeah, I'm fine and everything is great, and but when you actually research what the man was actually doing at that time, because you know the letters are dated yeah. and everything, uh, and and you know that he was actually right in the middle of combat, and that would be killed like a few hours later then the letter um has a special meaning uh, a different a very different vibe about it and um and it gets really really interesting very interesting because 
Well, thank you very much, Heather, for for everything, uh, like all the work you uh, you put in Till Victory, and um, and I'm really really looking forward to uh, to receiving my copy uh, probably uh, <laughs> sometime this month. I don't know. Uh, and thanks to uh, Pen and Sword Books for uh, finally putting it out there. It's all very exciting. It yeah, is, this is a good thing that's happening in 2020. Yeah, it is. Thank you very much, Heather. No problem. It's lovely to speak to you, Clement. Yeah, for me too. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye. Speak to you soon. Bye. All right. Now, in case it wasn't clear enough, Teal Victory is out worldwide at the end of the month. I cannot conclude this podcast without reading you another letter from the book. It was written by William White in the 76th Infantry Division to his wife after his very first attack on the Siegfried Line in February 1945. Again, try to picture it with an American accent. I thought of the Valentine card you sent me. I had to burn it before I went to the attack. I know what war is now. No one but God, the devil, the inventor. And the guys that have actually been up there know what it's like. It's a place where everyone suddenly realizes that no one can help them but God. And believe me, everyone calls on him. It's a place where you walk, eat and sleep, with death always searching for you. It's a place where you learn fear and learn to conquer it. It's a place where you always have to be on the alert, where there is never any rest and very little time to eat if you have anything to eat. Some of the boys in my company were without food for as long as four days. I was lucky, I was prepared for what happened. I had one K ration per day. It's pretty hard to lay on the ground and hear men screaming for help. When you can't do anything for them, or to see men drowning and have to let them go. Yes, I had a lot of close calls. But I guess someone was praying, so I'm still here. Twice, shells landed close enough to spit on them, but didn't go off. That's the time when you are very thankful to God. I guess I'll close now. Hope you enjoyed this special episode of the podcast. I'll be back next month with a new special guest. And if you haven't, catch up with the first episodes where I talk to World War II veterans. All the links for the book and social media are on tillvictory.com and I appreciate all the messages. Till next time, thank you for listening.